On 24th May 1847, a train was approaching Chester with the only thing in its way being the River Dee. At 6.25 in the evening, the train was travelling at a speed of 30 km per hour. The bridge it had to cross was newly constructed and had just been filled with ballast. As the train smoothly made its way across the bridge, the engine having just crossed the abutment and reached the land, the bridge suddenly collapsed. On that day, the collapse of the bridge tragically resulted in the death of 5 people and injured 9 others. This event was caused by a simple misconception related to trust compound girders which led to a major oversight in engineering. Hi, I am Hilal Alam from Al Zebra. Let's explore how this misconception caused one of the legends in engineering to overlook a crucial flaw in the design of the bridge. First, let's take a look at the design of the bridge. It was constructed at the beginning of the era of steel as bricks and stones were slowly being replaced by steel structures. The bridge design consisted of two running steel girder that supported 10 by 10 inch oak joists above the bottom flange. A 4 inch timber deck was then laid on the top of this with running rails and check rails fitted above it. Initially, ballast was not filled in. The bridge accommodated both upline and downline traffic, ensuring that no two upcoming trains had to wait to cross it. There were two piers located between the abutments. The bridge spanned approximately 320 feet and connected with a row of 40 foot long cast iron eye sections. Before delving into the cause of the collapse, let's examine what generally happens when a load is applied to a beam. Running through the middle of the beam is the neutral axis. When a load is applied, the beam bends with the top portion where the center of curvature is located getting compressed and the bottom portion is getting stretched. There would be a layer that experiences neither compression nor the tension load and this is called the neutral axis of the curvature beam. However, a problem arose due to the properties of the cast iron which is good at supporting compressive loads but not strong enough to withstand the tensile loads. To address this issue, the engineer Robert Stevenson made the bottom flange of the eye section wider to carry the tensile loads. To prevent sagging caused by the loads, rod iron cables were connected from the bottom flange to counteract the tensile forces. With the cast iron rails taking up the compression loads and the rod iron chain dealing with the tensile loads, the bridge appeared to be well equipped. Robert Stevenson incorporated a factor of safety of 4.3 in the design meaning that the bridge would withstand 4.3 times more loads than the allowable load. All fine. The trains were shuttling up and down at the allowable speed of 30 km per hour. However, a similar bridge at Hanwell caught fire due to cinders dropping from the engine onto the oak and timber. After hearing about the fire at Hanwell, Stevenson ordered for the track to be filled with ballast to prevent any potential fires. On the fateful day of May 24, 1847, the ballast laying had been completed and the fatal train was approaching the bridge. At 6.25 in the evening, the train was running at a speed of 30 km per hour and smoothly running on the bridge. However, as the engine had just crossed the abutment and reached the land while the tender and coaches were still on the bridge, the bridge suddenly collapsed. This is the only available sketch of the scenario. Captain John Simmons, Inspector of Railway, conducted an examination of the track after the incident. A couple of cracks were identified on the rail, but he concluded that the factor of safety was well above 3.0. When Robert Stevenson was brought under inquiry, he initially blamed the derailment of the train, but this explanation was rejected. Henry Robertson presented his version and attributed the collapse to excessive locomotive vibration. Robert Stevenson was not an ordinary person. He had successfully constructed several famous bridges such as the River Lee Bridge, T Bridge, York Bridge and Newton Kime Horrigate Bridge all made with cast iron wrought iron combinations. He was also the son of George Stevenson, the father of railways and his cousin George Robert Stevenson was a renowned railway engineer. Then what went wrong in this case? In his book, Design Paradigms, Case Histories of Error and Judgment in Engineering, Henry Petrosky points out the scaling effect on the dimensions. In all of Stevenson's previous bridges, the span length was not longer than 85 feet. However, the span length of the D bridge was 98 feet. 
In shorter versions, the torsional effects were minimal, but beyond a certain length, the torsional effects started to dominate. This was the opinion of the most experts. Recently, Alan Hayward delivered a lecture at the Institute of Structural Engineering with a detailed study on June 14, 2022. The YouTube link has been provided below for more in-depth details. He points out that not just the issue of lateral and torsional resistance, but also a basic misconception of trust compound girder was present. Let's examine the design again. Robert Stevenson not only enlarged the bottom flange of the cast iron, but also pre-stressed it by jacking it up a few inches. He then fitted a wrought iron cables on either side to withstand the tensile force and stretched them down a little. According to the Hayward calculation, the bending moment at the center of the span was 553 tons foot. What's wrong here? On the surface, it appears to be alright, but it's elusive. Hayward describes the situation with an example. If your cord sags due to weight, do you attach the cable at the head and foot boats? No, you would attach the cable to a stationary structure, right? But in the deep bridge and in the previous bridges, the cables were attached to the system itself. This did not provide any significant advantage. This is the reason cables are attached to the external structures or ground in cable stayed bridge structures. If the cables were not used, the bending moment at the center of the bridge would have been 576 ton foot instead of 553 ton foot. In addition, the unusually long span length weakened the bridge further. The actual factor of safety was not 4.3 but 1.1. The other bridges had the factor of safety just about 2 and thus they were able to withstand the loads. After this incident, there were several cast iron bridges were found to be weaker and subsequently changed and strengthened. This is the recent image of the D bridge. The deep bridge collapse was a tragic event that resulted in the loss of many lives and exposed flaw in the design and construction of cast iron bridges. However, it also served as a catalyst for improvement in bridge engineering and safety standards that have helped prevent similar disasters in the years since. With this I sign off and we will meet you in the next video. Till then, goodbye.